her constituents. Many thanks. And that concludes general questions. And the next item of business is First Minister's questions. We now move to question one. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. A, engagements Minister. to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Does the First Minister think that George Osborne has cut corporation tax enough, or is he urging the Chancellor to go further? First Minister. Well, uh, George Osborne, of course, is following in the footsteps of Gordon Brown, uh, who, uh, as Chancellor, cut uh, corporation tax. But the Scottish Government have modelled uh, the results of a corporation tax rate in Scotland 3% below the prevailing in the UK. The results of that show an additional, over the medium term, 27,000 jobs and an increase in Scottish uh, GDP of over 1%. Uh, I think the policy of this government should be, when we control corporation tax, uh, to set a competitive rate and then collect the corporation tax. <laughs> the policy of successive UK governments is to set the corpora corporation tax rate and then not collect it, which seems a very strange thing to do. I think that answer sounded like one of Mike Russell's bus trips from Campbellton. <laughs> But of course, Gordon Brown did indeed say he would cut corporation tax when it could be shown we could afford it. The difference is, Alex Salmon says, if we were independent now, he would cut corporation tax three points lower than George Osborne, whether it makes sense or not. However much, however much George Osborne cuts taxes for his mates in banking, Alex Salmon would cut it further. However deep Osborne could be seen in the pockets of corporate greed, Alex Salmond would be that bit deeper. He's saying to Google, to Amazon, to Starbucks, anyone who wants to evade tax, come to Scotland, there will be less tax to evade. So, if you would... If he would cut corporation tax three points lower than whatever George Osborne sets, if he could, doesn't it follow he would have to cut schools and hospitals deeper than George Osborne too? First Minister. Well, can I uh, introduce uh, a number of corrections for Joanne Lamont? Uh, Gordon Brown didn't say he would cut corporation tax. He, he did it. Uh, and then he boasted about doing it, said it was one of the, the great achievements of his uh, term as Chancellor of the Exchequer. I, I merely mention this because it doesn't put Joanne Lamont in a strong position to complain about the policy of cutting corporation tax when uh, Gordon Brown, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, actually did that uh, in office. Uh, secondly, she should have referred to my first answer. Uh, I thought an argument whereby you had a 3% uh, differential rate in corporation tax for Scotland and the, the rest of the UK it was a good one for Scotland because we had analysed it and it said it would create 27,000 jobs and an increase in GDP of over 1% over uh, the medium term. I also said that it seemed to me the task was to set a competitive rate of corporation tax and then collect it. Now, I know this is going to come as a surprise to Joanne Lamont, but the non-collection of corporation tax uh, across a, a range of companies didn't start under George Osborne as Chancellor. It started when the Labour Party were in government. So I think our policy of setting a, corp a competitive rate of corporation tax and then collecting it is substantially superior to the Labour Tory policy of setting a rate of corporation tax and then forgetting to collect it from key companies. I think we've come to a pretty pass when the First Minister imagines that he is in a strong position on this question, given that response to what I asked him. And if we were in a strong position, perhaps we can question who agrees with the First Minister's corporation tax policy. Well, we know he agrees with it, and we assume that by their silence that his backbenchers also agree with him. But the fact... Yeah. Of course. Yeah, there they go. Yeah, there they yeah. go. The only place that appears never to be any debate, of course, is on the SNP backbenches. However, we know that not Scottish business and not the unions are in support of him. Not the CBI Scotland, not the STUC, not the nation's accountants, ICAS. This week, not the Scottish Council for Development and Industry. Not even the chair of the Yes campaign. But you'll be glad to know he does have one supporter. It's tax exile Jim McCall. So, 
Can I ask the First Minister, does he agree with his one supporter, Jim McCall, that in an independent Scotland, capital gains tax should be abolished? First Minister, correct Joanne Lamont on the SCDI report. Can I refer her to page 22, which points out that a lower rate of corporation tax could have, quote, a positive effect on attracting further investment uh, to Scotland. Now, oh, oh, oh. If, if it did have a positive effect in attracting investment for Scotland, if, as the Scottish Government analysed, it would create 27,000 jobs in Scotland, if over the medium term it would increase Scottish GDP, then presumably the Labour Party would not oppose it on that basis. They would not seriously oppose creating 27,000 extra jobs in Scotland. They would not seriously oppose increasing Scottish GDP. Order. If these things are correct and be model to be correct, then that is a substantially good policy, especially since the Labour Chancellor Imp, 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 implemented a cut in corporation tax uh, in office. And as for uh, the attack on uh, Scotland's leading job creator, Jim McCall, you know, if the Labour Party had no campaign, are reduced to attacking uh, serious figures in Scottish job creation and entrepreneurship, uh, then it shows exactly why 500 businesses have signed up for the Yes Business campaign over the last two weeks. Final question, Joanne Lamon. Probably the most important word there was if. <laughs> and the First Minister calls and defends his own figures that some of us might think don't really apply much to scrutiny. And the fact of the matter is, of course, the SCDI says there is not great desire to participate in a race to the lowest tax environment. Now, we know that the First Minister thinks of himself as a talented economist. Not just that. <laughs> He likes quoting real economists too. He likes quoting real economists too. How many times has he told this chamber about his own advisor, Joseph Stiglitz, and all those Nobel Prizes he's won? What does Joseph Stiglitz say about this policy? Well, just a month ago, he said, and I quote, some of you have been told that lowering tax rates on corporations will lead to more investment. That fact is not true. It is, it is just a gift. It is just a gift to the corporations increasing inequality in our society. So I agree with the Nobel Prize winning Joseph Stiglitz and the businesses, the unions, the professionals who all say the First Minister is wrong. So can the First Minister tell us who is right? I can't believe the SNP backbenchers are calling an aide Gordon Brown when I'm telling him that his own economic advisor, his own economic advisor, a little bit of calm, please. his own economic advisor said it was wrong. So can the First Minister tell us who is right? Is it the First Minister? The ex-RBS economist and renowned advisor, nay, pen friend to Fred Goodwin, or is it his Nobel laureate economic advisor, Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who says he's wrong? First Minister. I, 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 I would point out that John Lamont can't really divorce herself from Gordon Brown uh, because he is now the leader of the Labour No campaign uh, in Scotland. Uh, which is separate, of course, from the Tory Labour No campaign led by Alistair uh, Darling. Uh, and I am delighted to, to know, and Joseph Stiglitz uh, is his name, he is a Nobel laureate, he is in the Council of Economic Advisers, he's pointed out that the the vast disparity in income levels in the UK under the Labour Party are not an efficient way to run an economy. It's part of the Fiscal Commission who's recommended the Stirling area post-independence. I'm delighted that Joanne Lamont is now going to accept the wisdom of Joseph Stiglitz and the other Nobel laureates on the committee. The importance of the policy and a competitive rate is to set a competitive rate to benefit the Scottish economy and then collect corporation tax. I think that is a substantially better position than the position under the Labour Party and now George Osborne, which our corporation tax is not collected. 
And I think having a competitive rate that is collected is a somewhat better than having a rate which is not collected. So if Gordon Brown implemented this policy, I don't think Joanne Lamont can divorce herself from it. It is good for the Scottish economy. It is going to generate jobs and investment in Scotland as contained in the SCDI report. And if we base our policies on what's best for jobs, investment, growth and the Scottish people, then that's why this government is in office and that's why Joanne Lamont's party is sitting over there. Thank you. Question two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no plans near future. Ruth Davidson. Deputy Presiding Officer, last year people were shocked by the Morton Hall baby ashes scandal. We know now that the issues raised in Edinburgh have spread to both Glasgow and to Aberdeen. Calls from the increasing number of affected parents for a public inquiry are growing ever louder. Will the First Minister now order a full public inquiry? First Minister. Well, the, the, the position, uh, as Ruth Davidson knows, is, is that the Edinburgh Inquiry is proceeding. There's coordination uh, from across the uh, councils of Scotland to give uh, an explanation. I think that is a, a, an effective uh, way to proceed, but uh, uh, the Cabinet uh, Secretary is always prepared to listen to, to positive suggestions in, in the matter. But I think the inquiry in Edinburgh uh, is proceeding. Uh, I think there's confidence in the way that it's being conducted. Other councils in Scotland have now responded, and I think responded sympathetically and now with understanding to the concerns of payments, uh, parents across Scotland. Uh, and, and therefore, I, I think the, the issue is being handled in a sensitive manner. But if Ruth Davidson wants to bring forward proposals as to why uh, a, a national public inquiry would actually benefit the, the parents, the bereaved parents, then of course we'll look at that. But I, I think there is a, a big argument for effectively proceeding in the way that's now being done, both in terms of speed, in terms of giving people the answers they want, and in terms of having the corrective policies which have now been released in guidelines across the country. Thank you. Ruth Davidson. Well, I, I do appreciate the steps that have been made on this issue, but those steps are being increasingly overtaken by events. Um, yes, the Edinburgh Inquiry is proceeding, and in particular, there's also Lord Bonamy's commission which has no direct representation from the parents themselves, despite them being promised as much. On Friday, Lord Bonamy said that parents would be able to make a written submission uh, until the 19th of July. However, this week it has emerged that the independent audit of what went on in Aberdeen won't now be presented until the 24th of September. So that means that affected parents in a whole area of the country will have no voice in this process. And I agree with the First Minister that, that new protections have to be put in place, but parents are asking for answers on what happened to their child, and this Commission is not designed to do that. So in light of this new information, the only way to get what everybody in this chamber wants, which is justice for the affected families right across Scotland, is a full public inquiry. Will the First Minister please reconsider? First Minister. I, 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 can I just correct a, a couple of things, Ruth Davis? I mean, the purpose of the Bonamy review is to get into place proper procedures, which we, we think is the overwhelming priority, that to get in place now procedures which should have been in place in some local authorities in the past and haven't been, to correct the position and not to delay to correct that position. I, I don't think Ruth Davis is correct in terms of the parental representation on the Bonamy Review, and uh, the, I can give, give her that, uh, uh, that information, and I think she should be uh, aware of that. But that is not the same thing as the investigation, the one that's taking place in Edinburgh, and ones that may take place elsewhere, which is to look at the past and find out exactly what happened. And I think there is a role for what Lord Bonamy is doing, and that's to correct the position right now to make sure that in the future procedures are correctly applied, not to wait for the inquiry to recommend that, because it's pretty clear uh, and seems to be substantially based on the evidence that's there as to what the correct procedures should be. So get that done. Uh, by all means, we'll look at the, the arguments in terms of nature of inquiry, but there is a substantial advantage in proceeding as quickly as we're doing at the present moment uh, and meeting, I think, the, the concerns of parents and, indeed, the wider community. Thank you very much. Now a constituency supplementary from Jenny Mara. The First Minister will be aware of reports that police staff without the appropriate qualifications have been taking fingerprints in Dundee and in Arbroath. Has the First Minister had reports of this happening anywhere else across Scotland? And can the First Minister reassure people in my region 
that the review will be conducted as swiftly and as thoroughly as possible, as there is grave danger that evidence could be dismissed in serious cases because of this breach of protocol. First Minister. Well, yes, I can provide that uh, reassurance. The review will be conducted as swiftly as possible, and any lessons learned from the review will be applied uh, across the country. So I hope that Jenny Mara will accept that reassurance. Thank you. Neil Finlay, supplementary, please. Uh, BAM and Balfour Beatty Air Contractors bidden to build the new Edinburgh Sick Kids Hospital. These two companies have been up to their necks in the blacklisting of over 3,000 UK and 500 Scottish construction workers. Will the First Minister use his influence with these companies to get them to own up to what they have done, apologise to those involved and agree to pay compensation for ru ruined lives and careers? And does he agree that if they do not, then they should not be awarded any contracts for the public sector? First Minister. Well, I do not uh, know if the, the member is familiar with the points I made at the STC conference, but I am happy to send them a, a copy of their remarks. And I was addressing in particular what we believe the government can do in terms of public sector uh, contracts uh, to make sure that blacklisting is eradicated from the Scottish labour market. Thank you. Question three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. Uh, issues of uh, importance to the people of Scotland. Willie Rennie. SNP MSPs say they are prepared to back the closure of the local court in return for a new justice centre for their area. Courts at Cooper, Peebles, Dingwall, Arbroath, Stonehaven and Rothsey have a history stretching back 500 years. With only 12 days before this Parliament decides their future, can the First Minister tell these backbenchers today when and where these new justice centres will be built? First Minister. Uh, SNP MSPs uh, uh, and constituent representatives are making strong representations on behalf of their constituents, as you would expect them uh, to do. Uh, perhaps if the Liberal Democrats had employed that policy, they would have more constituency members than they do. Will there any? I expected some sort of explanation about new justice centres, but nothing was forthcoming. It's ridiculous that he doesn't have worked out plans for the justice centres. He can't even give us one single date and one location for these justice centres that his own backbenchers say are going to come. He already has a justice centre in Cooper, but he's planning to close it, to shut it down. He's already got one, but that's what he does. Last week we heard from the court service that more courts could even close before any justice centres are built. The Law Society spoke out this week as well. So the clock is ticking. Twelve days for SNP members on the Justice Committee to make that big decision, to back their government or back their community. 500 years of local service against this government's cavalier and chaotic approach. Wouldn't it be safer, wouldn't it be safer for SNP members to stand up for their communities and reject his court closures? First Minister. Or alternatively, to represent their constituents and look for the best effective way to ensure justice uh, across Scotland. I know that Willie Rennie lives uh, in a world where public expenditure restrictions imposed by his colleagues at Westminster in conjunction with the Tories do not exist. I know he likes to believe that somehow public services in Scotland should be immune from Westminster cutbacks, but nobody, but nobody in Scotland uh, does not understand the position, which is exactly why the Liberal Democrats used to have a football team in this Parliament, and now they've got a subs bench. <laughs> Thank you very much. We now move to question four. Stuart Stevenson. To ask the First Minister what economic value the Scottish Government places on services from Highlands and Islands airports to hub airports with worldwide connections. Minister. Well, maintaining capacity and services from Highlands and Isles airports, worldwide connections is essential for that area's uh, economic development. The effect, of course, of the UK Government's air passenger duty has been amply demonstrated by Flybe's recent announcement the sale for slots at Gatwick. The chairman of Flybe, Jim Friends, said, quote, with the absence of a regional aviation strategy, the Government's penalistic and ludicrous policy of charging air passenger duty on both legs of a domestic flight, I am afraid it is inevitable that high-frequency services from the UK regions will ultimately be squeezed out. Uh, that is a significant statement. It is a warning statement, and it under underlines the absolute necessity for air passenger duty to be devolved to this Parliament. Stevenson. 
Uh, does the First Minister recall that in 2008 the air services from Inverness to Heathrow uh, were ended? And in the light of that, is it not now uh, important that protecting the links from Inverness to Gatwick is ever more essential? Now, of course, these are not my words. These are the words of the local MP, Danny Alexander, in 2008. Is it not rank hypocrisy, First Minister, that the local MP had one opinion in 2008 and has done absolutely nothing in government to support air services from Inverness? First Minister. Well, we, we should remember in context that Alexander, uh, Danny Alexander is a Liberal Democrat, so adopting two positions at the same time may in itself be a part of a party, party policy. But I think it is for the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and the local member for Inverness a rather invidious position to be responsible for the very air passenger duty and taxation which is driving and threatening services in Inverness and then complaining about it and posing as a defender. So perhaps if we agree on the position of devolving air passenger duty to this Parliament to have a policy that benefits the Scottish economy, then Danny Alexander would be relieved of his difficulty of having simultaneously to be the Treasury's man in Inverness while pretending to be Inverness man in the Treasury. Many thanks. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, will uh, the First Minister hold talks with the UK Government and indeed Flybe and EasyJet, who now um, have the flights from Inverness Airport, will he look to having a PSO on routes to Gatwick Airport? And will he also speak to the airlines about connectivity from the islands through to Gatwick, which used to be booked through one operator and now will require to be booked through two? And these talks uh, are ongoing with the Transport Minister and the airport carriers uh, at the present moment. But the, the, the member should direct herself not just to what Flybe have said, but the extent of the, the studies across the Scottish airports and the Scottish characters, uh, carriers who are looking exactly at the differential impact the air passenger duty is having on Scottish flights. This is the, the key and source of the difficulty. And therefore, I hope that the member will join with the, with the government in calling for APD to be dissolved, devolved to this parliament so that we can produce a, an airport and passenger policy which actually benefits the Scottish economy as opposed to threatening vital services. Thank you very much. Question five, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what his response is to Audit Scotland's report managing early departures from the Scottish public sector which states that the public sector is spending £280 million a year on early departure schemes. First Minister. Well, the report uh, goes on to, to note uh, that the effective savings that uh, have been made by the uh, voluntary service arrangements conducted by the Scottish Government, uh, under the funding pressure from Westminster, is inevitable that there be reductions in Scottish public service numbers. Uh, our unions, our policy of no compulsory redundancies, I think, is the right policy, not just because it treats people in that position humanely and with respect, but also it gives security to those who remain within the, the public sector. It's a policy supported by our unions, it's a policy pursued by this government, and it's a policy which is not available elsewhere in these islands. Michael McMahon. I thank the First Minister for his response. I'm not sure if he agrees that Audit Scotland is right to criticise the extensive use of early exit packages, but does he at least share my unease at the concerns raised with me by civilian staff within the newly created Police Scotland that a pool of money has been allocated to provide for exit packages for a tranche of senior police officers to reduce their numbers through enhanced redundancy settlements? as it is not unheard for senior officers from within the police and fire and rescue services to take exit packages only ret to return on the same or similar capacities. Will the First Minister give the Chamber a commitment today that if and when senior police officers take golden goodbyes, they will not thereafter be able to say golden allo, allo, allo to new similar jobs within Police Scotland? First Minister. I, I, I can give the absolute assurance that the police service and the fire services in Scotland will be managed rather more effectively than many Labour local authorities did in terms of exactly the things, exactly the things that the member is speaking about. But I don't think you should be allowed 
uh, to put the Audit Scotland report in the context they did. I mean, for example, in page four of the Audit Scotland report, early retirement and voluntary redundancies can be a useful way of avoiding the delays and costs of compulsory redundancies. Once the initial outlay has been recouped, they provide significant savings for organisations. So I think the uh, members should reflect on the balance of the Audit Scotland report and what it had to say about that. And they should also reflect on the range of cases, a range of which I could quote to them, uh, where the practices and policies of some of his colleagues across local government have been brought seriously into question. Thank you very much. Ken McIntosh. Thank you. When I asked uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance yesterday why the Scottish Government was spending ten times as much pushing people out the door as they are trying to find people employment, he said in his defence the same excuse that the First Minister has just given, that the Scottish Government has a policy of no compulsory redundancies, and furthermore, that they only use compromise agreements in a minority of cases. Labour's FOIs on the subject reveal that, since Mr Salmon came to power, the Scottish Government has spent £10 million on compulsory redundancies and £45 million on compromise agreements. Can you explain this? First Minister. Well, as Ken McIntosh knows, that we have introduced a compulsory redundancy policy over the last two or three years progressively uh, across central government in Scotland. Now, the no compulsory redundancy policy, are the Labour Party saying they would not have this policy? Because if they are saying they would not have this policy, then they better tell the public sector unions who are firmly in favour of it. Ken McIntosh should also have a look at the public service in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK, that public service numbers are down less in Scotland than they are across the UK because of the sensitivity in which we handle the policy. I think it's right and proper to have no compulsory redundancies as a policy. If Ken McIntosh, as the Labour Party spokesman, looking after the welfare of public sector employees, says he would have compulsory redundancies, then let him say so because I think our policy meets the requirements of the public services in Scotland and is much more in tune with what the Scottish people demand than anything Ken McIntosh could come up with. Thank you. Question six, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the opinions expressed in the briefing paper, the funding of higher education in Scotland, the UK and internationally. Well, we welcome contributions to the debate. In that light, I'm sure that Ms. Smith will have noticed this morning's contribution from University of Scotland. They have published legal advice from solicitors Anderson Strathern on University P's post-independence. They explain why, under EU law, it could be permissible to continue to charge students from the rest of the UK tuition fees. Well, this shows there's a real debate going on in Scotland. This government has already delivered free education in the face of the naysayers who said it couldn't be done. We are absolutely confident we will continue to deliver free education in an independent Scotland. Ms Smith. Uh, I'm grateful to the First Minister for that answer. In light of the legal advice that has been published this morning by University of Scotland, could the First Minister now confirm exactly which groups of students would, uh, would not pay fees in an independent Scotland and whether the Scottish Government has received legal advice confirming that the European Parliament would agree to any exemptions for the current EU law on this matter? Minister. I don't think she's got our European authorities uh, correct as far as the Commission, the Parliament and the Court of uh, uh, Justice is concerned. But I would have thought that Liz Smith might have bothered to read the legal advice which was published this morning. Now, I know that, I know that uh, it's unfortunate her question has been somewhat overtaken by events, but the art of asking questions is to adapt to changing conditions in the debate that's going on. And I would have thought she would have welcomed the fact to have the legal advice from University of Scotland which shows based on both equity and residence then the policy of free education could be pursued in independent Scotland. Of course to have a policy of free education you first have to want education to be free. And the other unionist coalition emerging in this parliament between the Conservatives, the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party is that each of these parties want to impose tuition fees on the students of Scotland. So the first requirement is to have a government like this one who believes in free education and therefore spells out a policy why that free education policy will continue to be pursued in an independent Scotland. Hugh Henry, briefly, please. Line officer, perhaps the art of answering a question is actually to give an answer. I, 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 have, I have read that legal opinion. I have read that legal opinion, and it doesn't give the unequivocal answer that the First Minister seems to suggest. But what he could possibly tell us is, if it is correct, 
and if he accepts it, does that mean that European Union students will now qualify for free tuition and that, oh sorry, that they, they, they will no longer qualify, they will no longer Order. qualify free, for free tuition Order. and that in fact European Union students could be charged for university tuition in Scotland? Well, I, I think you have me should have a bit more practice in asking questions before I, I criticise uh, the answers. I, I would have thought, now I know this is inconvenient for the Labour Party and the Tories and the Liberal Democrats, the, the parties which want to impose tuition fees on the students. Yes. Well, I, I see Joanne Lamont shaking her head. She said on the 17th of December last year that tuition fees were the most obvious option. Now, what is the most obvious option if it's not an attempt to impose tuition fees on the students of Scotland? So I think the legal advice today, the firm resolve of this government to base our policy on residence and equity gives assurance that as long as this government is in power, then there will be no tuition fees imposed on the students of Scotland, and education will be on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay. And that concludes questions to the First Minister.